Um, do you want to try and... Uh, how are we going to do this? Talk to me, Goose. We're going to have to punch it through. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Risk is something we all have to deal with when it comes to exploring the unknown. Wide open water, beautiful overhanging bluffs, and the real potential for trophy trout is enough to get any angler interested in this idea. But in order to fish one of the area's only true trout rivers, it took a lot of time and research, and it almost never happened. This is 13 miles floating and fishing the Yellow River. This was set to be a big week. I just didn't quite realize it yet, and truth be told, it started out just like any other. Kelsey and I, we would go on occasional walks around the property to try and break up the monotony of the daily grind, and in the evenings, I would always make sure to hit the weights or do some trail running to stay in shape for upcoming mountain adventures. But like always, I had work projects with deadlines and the editing grind, it was really starting to pile up. And I would like to blame all these distractions for my mistake because it's just not like me to miss something this big. And looking back, I take full responsibility for this massive oversight. This was set to be the most involved adventure of this driftless trip and I almost dropped the ball. Blake and I, we were planning to tackle the Yellow River. It must have been around midweek when I finally started to dig into some general information about this watershed, and it didn't take long for anxious shivers to slide down my spine as I was immediately met with red flags. Diving in a little deeper into the maps themselves, the red flags, they made complete sense. The 13 mile section we were planning on floating was completely bordered by private land. As anglers, we should all be aware that water access laws vary from state to state. For the vast majority of rivers and streams in Iowa, stream beds are considered to be a part of a landowner's private property. Stream beds equals private land. Translation, waiting equals trespassing. This was a massive monkey wrench in our plans. The mood of the farmhouse matched the nasty weather that rolled in the next day. It must have been my Missouri route showing, but water access laws in the Show Me State at least allow for waiting if the stream is navigable by boat. I cross-referenced every single Iowa angling book I owned and read through a handful of articles pertaining to this issue. Every author stated that the Yellow River could not in any way, shape, or form be waited without trespassing. Blake and I, we had been talking about this trip for months now, and we'd hyped it up in such a major way. You know how it goes? This was supposed to be the trip. We contemplated alternative plans, and they were all okay, but we didn't want okay. We wanted the Yellow River. Something about this situation just didn't sit right in my head. Call me stubborn or call me skeptical, I just couldn't believe that this was the case. I needed to find out for myself. Bright and early the following day, I started making cold calls to every river coordinator, fisheries biologist, and conservation officer in this corner of Iowa. I was met with a lot of voicemails at first, and a few hours into this wild goose chase, I finally started to get some calls back, and slowly but surely, progress was made. One of my biggest leads came when I heard the phrase, incidental use. The state employee I was speaking with sent over an absolute gold mine of information with regards to this particular issue. And that is where this hearing from the office of the attorney general comes into play. Essentially, it broke down the various river designations and what is considered incidental use with regards to outdoor recreationalists. This was big and I have it linked down below if anyone watching would like to go through it themselves. Also, while we're on this subject, don't be afraid to contact state agencies. More often than not, they are happy to help you with whatever you're looking for. And trust me, a 10 minute phone call can make everyone's lives that much easier. But now this little snowball was starting to pick up speed and pick up mass. I received a lot of good information and multiple green lights from individuals in various departments. But what I really needed was a solid confirmation from a conservation officer. 
Yes, I know, I was asking for permission rather than forgiveness, but I would much rather play it safe than sorry. And as luck would have it, I was still recording when I got the most important call of the day. So what can you tell me about incidental use? Now because I was filming B-roll, I didn't quite realize I was still recording at first when the call initially came in, so I'm gonna mute out everything from this individual I was speaking with. It just didn't seem right to include without him being aware I was filming at the time, but essentially we went back and forth a bit, trying to get a comprehensive understanding of what incidental use meant in the realm of the law. Well, and I guess I should give context. I'm from Missouri, so we're the, we're the same way as Wisconsin, where all the stream beds are technically up to a high water mark public land, as long as they are not navigable streams. Right. That's why planning this trip, I'm trying to do my best to get everything correct before I show up. And I just want to avoid any conflicts with be it private landowners or a conservation agent, um, you know, not doing my due diligence as a rec recreationalist. So yeah, that's why I'm kind of calling and asking. So to just, just again, to confirm, if I were to put in at a public access point, I can in fact get out of my canoe and wade and fish in the Yellow River as long as I'm not on the bank. I can wade right. as incidental use in the stream bed. Yep. Perfect. He proceeded to tell me all sorts of stories of conflict between landowners and boaters floating down the Yellow River. This again tells me that there's a ton of people using this river throughout the summer, which contradicts everything I read and heard prior to this call. But while he did that, I finally realized that I had been recording this entire time. Again, it just didn't feel right to include his part of the conversation, so I hope you believe what I'm saying. Yep, I mean, my plans were not to be, and this kind of sounds wrong, not to be sneaky, but to, to leave no trace. Like, I, I don't have any intentions of, you know, building Shangri-La and swinging a hammock. I'm purely wanting to float and fish this, um, and I have yep. a canoe available, so, um, the waiting aspect of it was, you know, going through all these, you know, these different um, attorney general jurisdictions and then hearsay from the commercial outfitters and then, you know, different conservation agents like yourself. I think uh, I finally, I finally got the answer um, I was looking for, which is awesome. As the call wrapped up, I made sure to thank him for his time and very valuable information. And he may not have realized it, but he just made two trout bums very, very happy. But. Now, with the weekend right around the corner, we had to scramble to pull the rest of this trip together. It was time for boat prep. In order to properly partake in a float trip, you gotta have something to float on. Luckily for us, a co-worker of Blake's had so kindly allowed us to borrow his canoe. So, a huge shout out goes to you. If you're watching right now, you know who you are. So, thank you so much again. And while I was wildly distracted by clucking chickens and scampering barn kittens, Blake tracked down the mighty vessel high up in the rafters. And it didn't take us long to get it down and strapped in tight. Well, tight enough to make it back to the farm at least. With only hours to spare, we unloaded our newly acquired craft and prepped the rest of our fishing and filming gear for an early morning. It was almost hard to believe, but after frantic research, hours on the phone, and nearly giving up on this adventure, our maiden voyage down the Yellow River was gonna happen after all. Engines idled in the crisp morning air. I loaded up the rest of the fishing stuff while Blake tied down the last few straps. Was it strapped down good? Yeah, I'd say so. Was it legal? Well, technically yes. But Iowa can be one windy place, and when you mix that with highway speeds, you're kinda asking for trouble. So before we sped up, Blake pulled over to give it one last final check. I just wanted to check him before we got on highway speed, so. Yep. Sounds good, man. There were a few shifts and bumps along the way, but for the most part, she held steady in the dim morning light. Growing up in Missouri, I've been on my fair share of float trips, but as the sun crept up over the horizon, I can't remember starting a float with such low temps. It was really chilly. I could already feel the cold water numbing my extremities, but there was no turning back now. We dropped off Blake's truck at the takeout point and punched it upstream. Anticipation of the morning bite kept the sense of urgency levels and RPM gravel pops at an all-time high. Pulling into the access point, we had just barely beat the sun to the water, which in my book is always a great start to the day. But there was no time to get hung up on small victories. The easiest part of the day was now done. 
it was time to load up all our float trip junk into the canoe and overthink whether we packed too much or not enough. All right, Blake, before I put the big cam away, I need first impressions, initial thoughts. What are you thinking? What are you feeling? It's cold. It's going to be a long day. It's going to be a good day. Um, big fish only. Big fish only. That's right. <laughs> okay. One last check. Do you have everything in there? Everything I have. Phone, keys, wallet, that, bag, paddle. Well, as long as everything's in there. Nothing. It's not there. We don't have it. It's gone. <laughs> so. All right. Well, this is it, man. Let's make it happen. All right. How do you want to do this? Just angle it? We want to shoot out probably that, right? Yeah, okay. We're down to clean that. All right, you want me in first? Yeah. I think so too. Oh, baby. What do you think of that? <laughs> Floating. Holy hell. <laughs> We're here, boys. We're here. We did it. We freaking did it. God, this water was perfect. I know. It felt so good to dig that paddle deep and glide effortlessly through the forbidden waters of the Yellow River. Even though we were here to fish, we didn't stop much after we launched. The air and water temps were still really cold, and we were hoping to get a bit of distance between us and any other potential floaters on the day. This time was mostly filled with getting a feel for the weight distribution and drooling at potential honey holes we should have fished. Yeah, this whole riffle section, I feel like you could swing a streamer through it and just rip. They just gotta be. And that's where the big ends will stay. Right under that stick. Oh my God. Big ends. With each stroke of the paddle, the confidence in our sea legs went up. So much so that I decided to bust out the big cam yeah, to get some sweet it. shots. Now, at this point, we, mostly me, were riding the line of downright cocky. The yellow wasted no time putting us right back in our place. Um, do you want to try and, uh, how are we going to do this? Talk to me, Goose. We're going to have to punch it through? We're going to have to now. I need to paddle the front. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I got this. Okay, stay there. I'm gonna jump out and push this back out to that rock. Okay? Yeah. Oh, okay, we took on quite a bit of water there. That one there, I don't know what it had done. It just kept S-curving. I mean, by the time I saw this, I, I honestly don't think we, we could have even made it under that without getting out anyway. Probably not. Incidental. The armchair canoe expert might say we could have handled that better, and in hindsight, I might agree. But in the moment, things happen so quick, Blake and I were extremely lucky we didn't tip right there and then. This right here is a perfect example of where incidental use comes into play. With this down tree, we had to jump out of the canoe and wade. It would have been next to near impossible to get around it any other way. So with any hope of staying somewhat dry and warm now thrown out the window, we hopped back in and took a much more conservative approach to future runs. Oh, this along there looks nice. Pretty deep too. <laughs> it's a rainbow. Let's go. <laughs> oh, hilarious. It would be. 
It was a stalker, it's a stalker. The stalker, it's a stalker. This is why we came. I don't know why, but when you swung on that, I was like, oh my god, a big fish. I know, it felt good. It felt really good. And then I saw it jump, I'm like, okay, I don't need to run. Just a little feller. Well, there we go. Skunk off, first fish of the day. See ya. Nice. Oh yeah. Oh, and I don't have this. Oh, hell yeah. Hey, nice. dude. Great fish to start the day. That's what we're here for. That's what we're here for, exactly. Right on the, right on the edge of the lake. Chinny chin chin. Great way to start the day. <laughs> what a beautiful fish, man. Bye, Mr. Man. We did it. Skunk off. <laughs> Time to float home. <laughs> Bigs. Bigs only. Those first two fish lifted a massive weight off our shoulders. This whole trip was quite the gamble, and if all else went to hell, we can at least take solace in the fact we at least didn't get skunked. Now that the river was becoming a bit easier to navigate, Blake suggested I pick up the rod and do some fishing from the boat. And so, I did. Well, we did it. Off cam, we did it. First fish on the boat. There we go, on the mini meat whistle. Like, like he's supposed to. What a good fish, thank you. How awesome is that, dude? <laughs> that, that's so cheeky. Well, that little brown kinda gave us false hope because even around mid-morning, we were still floating hard on the struggle bus. A big effort was made to stop at what we thought would be productive runs, and my god did we fish them hard. Deep nymph rigs and trash pandas alike were furiously thrown at any fishing looking water, and yet, nothing. This was supposed to be the promised land, full of big sloppy browns and holdover rainbows the size of corn silos, but for whatever reason, the fish need to be sleeping in on this Saturday morning. So after we passed our first bridge for the day, a bit more contemplation was in order. It was time to chill for a bit and stop for a much needed mid-morning beer break. That, because it's the other, it's like, oh, they're gonna be freaking giant over there, or they're gonna be so many over there. And I mean, I'll be honest with you one thing too. I think we are behind, I think we're missing something. Whether it's a location, whether it's a rig, I just think we've covered enough water and not gotten bit enough in a high product like you know what i'm saying like we've covered enough high quality water that yeah. i think we're missing something Some so small. they're eating nymphs they're they're chasing streamers yeah like uh. like maybe just keying in more on like where they're at sitting you know what i mean like it's just weird like just those two big runs that we fish thoroughly until we catch one to two out of them a piece one little dinkers too as you say i'm like we're missing we're missing something, yeah. whether we're spooking them, whether we're, you know what I mean, like, I think, I think we're still learning. With newfound warmth and confidence, the day began to shift. Even if just by a little, that was still something. It was my turn to wade and fish this run, and instead of focusing on the deeper sections, I decided to punch it hard into the faster riffle sections. And by some miracle, this slight shift in approach yielded two small rainbows back to back. Not exactly what Blake and I were hoping for on this epic float, but it was a step in the right direction and a much needed clue. If you folks at home can't tell, we are riding the struggle boat today. It's uh, few and far between, but we're kind of tweaking something as the sun's gotten up, but there goes the second rainbow. He gone, let's keep moving. Not but a few bends down, this new approach was validated yet again with a canoe fish drifted through some choppy water just before it dumped into a deep eddy. That dimey dime swam back and we figured he must have some friends, so we hopped out and fished the deeper portions. Blake fished it hard and the drifts looked so juicy. Knee deep in the mud, I watched my brother in arms serve up some of the cleanest drifts this side of the upper Iowa. That hopper, it slid over the surface with not so much as a wiggle. At this point, it was almost insulting how beautiful the approach was and yet, no fish. The only thing that was biting consistently were the hunger pangs of an early morning fueled solely on bush light and cold toes. It was rounding off right around 11 and this bejaggled boat crew needed a major pick-me-up. 
Luckily, we had the perfect river lunch waiting for us, cooled down in the cold. This right here is a huge shout out to my mom because she would always pack chicken tendies on the river. Cold chicken tendies are like nothing else. It is the ultimate game changer. And today I'm changing Blake's mind about the cold chicken tendy. Because we need a pick me up. <laughs> in a major way. Can you pick me up? <laughs> There's not much in this world stronger than the power of nostalgia. Cold chicken tendies and watermelon transports me right back to some warm sandbar somewhere on the Merrimack River with my parents, big sis, and dog soaking in the magic of the Ozarks on a Missouri summer day. Now, of course, the supporting characters in a river lunch like oatmeal cream pie, cold beer, and goldfish crackers help elevate the overall experience, but you just can't beat ice cold quick trip tendies dunked in that honey musty truly a culinary experience. Stepping back into the canoe, the sun and spirits were much higher. And at this point, Blake and I started to finally find our groove. We'd gotten much better at reading the water in advance and making the most out of the runs as we floated by. I mean, who, who knows how many fish could be in there? Do you want to bank it? <laughs> that, whatever that was. Hold us here, Captain. No, no, no. Give it time, give it time. There it is. <laughs> Not... <laughs> I'll take it, man. Not a bad fish, though. Yeah. <laughs> No, don't sit on my lap, buddy. We gotta go. You gotta go. Oh, there we go. Oh, graceful. With each and every fish caught, we were slowly putting the puzzle pieces together. Each spunky chub or little brown would be another data point needed to build up how and where these fish were eating. Changing up flies and focusing much more on the faster water seemed to be the ticket. That is something. Am I good? There we go. That's something. Well, there we go. That's a beautiful little brown. Today certainly hasn't been easy. Definitely not what we expected. Um, I think Blake and I kind of had every assumption we were going to come in here and whoop them. But. So far it's been few and far between. We've kind of been prospecting, so Blake is being very generous and kind of leading me on the way as I'm casting forward prospecting. And so like this, we just caught a fish out of this run as we're floating through. So now we might stop and actually try and pick this apart a little bit more efficiently rather than just floating over it. And so. that is exactly what Blake did. Oh my gosh. That's a good fish, Blake, that's a good fish. That's a better fish, man. <laughs> yes, hey! dude, let's freaking go. What the heck? <laughs> oh, it's a much better fish. Gorgeous brown. Oh yeah, that adipose is fired at me. Nice. Good stuff. <laughs> Holy cow, dude. How good does that feel? I mean, it's not even, I mean, it's, we're freaking out, but like, it's, that feels like really good. <laughs> Great fish, man. Fantastic. Oh, oh, he says, I'm going, he I'm out. That. He got Let's the bird. go. With that nice brown back in the drink, the action of our day reached its boiling point. You knocked me down, swept my feet off the ground, left me on the floor. Hard to resist, got me looking like this, like the one before. Cause I must be strong. This might go on for long Guess I was wrong And he's always there for you I keep living alone 
this trip brings a whole new meaning to keep your feet in the water. Yeah, no shit. Right? <laughs> Yeah, dude. Yes, dude, let's freaking go. I think we figured it out. Let's go. Yeah, dude, let's go. To say we've been struggling would be kind of uh, a privileged attitude, let's just say, because uh, we've been doing well. We've been catching fish here and there, on the boat, and at you know, certain spots that we stop at. But it's not normal for Blake and I, and we've been kind of scratching our brains this entire time wondering what the heck, what are we not doing? And something that we noticed is that the water is warmer than most trout rivers that we have usually been on, like for you Missouri folks, the current river or out west, some of those bigger rivers, they're cold, almost like they hurt when you step in them. So what we've been trying to key in on is riffle sections, where the water is moving, where it's shallow and where it's fast, where the oxygen is high and the water is cold. That seems to be where the fish are sitting. And so we've adjusted our rigs. Second half of the day, especially after lunch, we've really kind of keyed them in. And this, this is probably my nicest fish of the day. That's a shouldered up brown trout straight from the Yellow River and it's dandy, I tell you what. But yeah, it's been a blast trying to figure him out one uh, one dimey dime at a time and I think, well, it's time to let him back. See you, buddy. Uh, it's a decent, it's a decent fish. Well, filming is nothing short of impossible on this canoe. I've got the best captain this side of the Mississippi. Everyone give Blake a big special shout out for towing my ass around. <laughs> but we're trying our best to film the floating section. We're actually finding a lot more, especially in these straighter sections, which is nice. But yeah, I guess we need to keep going down the reel. Now I guess any of you out there watching, you're just gonna have to take my word for it, but I asked Blake on several occasions to switch spots with me so that he could do some fishing at the front of the boat. With each and every advance, he kindly declined and said that he actually enjoyed steering and positioning the boat. And hell, he was doing such a damn good job, it was hard to argue with the man. So I kept hammering the fish as best as I could while we were rounding the corner on the final few miles of this float. Well, that's a fish. Ugh, nice. We got him. How's it going? Doing really well. Yeah. Good luck to you. And they're definitely eager to eat when presented correctly. But they all seem to be very similar size. You're gonna say, I don't know what. I mean, this has been the slot. A lot of them, but yeah, this has definitely been the slot. Something worth mentioning that we noticed throughout the day was that a lot of these browns and rainbows were right around the same size. I'm unsure of the natural reproduction rates in bigger systems like this, but I do remember reading somewhere that the Iowa DNR throws in thousands of fingerling trout into the yellow every single year. This would make sense as to why there were so many catchable fish around the same size. Now, I'm not a biologist, but if I had to guess, a lot of these fish we found were right around that two to three year size range. Definitely not the monsters we expected to find, but after getting to see so many miles of this river, I still firmly believe that this water can produce some absolute behemoth trout. Hello. Hey. Bye. Hey, Bye. Sir. Let's go. Come 
Let's go. There you go. Very nice. So as that sun started its downward trajectory over the hills, we shifted our focus from fishing to paddling. With each bridge we passed, we could kind of get a gauge on how many miles we had left. And I will be the first to admit that we bit off significantly more than what we could chew. Daylight was now a hot commodity and Blake and I had to punch it into absolute overdrive if we wanted to get off the river before dark. But with how beautiful each bend was, it was hard to even begin to complain. The pace of this kind of fishing allows you to see so much in such a short period of time. Well, relatively. We had the absolute privilege of observing this river change in a significant way the closer it meandered to the big river. This great unknown was now a bit more familiar in our minds and the memory was now forever captured on film. As we pulled in to the final bridge with our takeout point, Blake and I let out a great exhale knowing that we had done it. This would no doubt be the first of many floats on this incredible trout river and after many months of speculating, we had finally fished and floated the mighty yellow. Well, if you were seeing this, and that means this week of Driftless Adventures is officially over. And all I have to say, as always, folks, is thank you so much for sticking around and watching these videos all the way to the end. I don't quite get the YouTube algorithm, but it certainly helps. And I appreciate you guys kind of sticking around for a different style of video. I'm trying to capture all this Driftless, all this uh, magic, let's just say, the life side and the fishing side, and putting it into these kind of, uh, yeah, little isolated episode so i do appreciate it and you know be it the youtube the instagram website discord this file season community it's growing like a damn weed and i have you guys to thank for that so keep being awesome out there i appreciate it and love talking to you so yeah hit me up if you ever have any questions and folks wherever you find yourself be it in beautiful driftless scenery like this or in your backyard i sure hope you're keeping those feet in the water and until next time tight lines <laughs>